prayers. Filling our baptismal ponds, we welcome back to this space those who have been on long journeys, those who don't live so far away but make it here anyway. We center ourselves in these sacred waters, reminding ourselves that God enables us <coughs> to reinvent ourselves as many times throughout our lifetimes as we need. And anytime we dip our fingers in this water, we get a chance to start over. A new to-do list, a new naughty or nice list, a new chance to reconnect with that God who has never stopped connecting with us. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat him in the ashes. And then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die! But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Last week I spoke a little bit about my ideas about what the kingdom of God might be like, all the ways that acting out like kids is a way that God can still love us. And you see that, that theme still present in, my, in Mark's gospel. But you might have also noticed that I played a trick on your emotions a little bit. I don't know if it was a trick or just a welling up. Those of you who have deep, intimate connections with some of the hymns we've sung so far, or have been sung by the choir, started with the rousing Christmas hymn, reminding us of the ways that God is present at the beginning, the excitement that we have when people are born into this world, and the song that was just sung, often heard at funerals, right? A beautiful time to sing it, a beautiful hymn, even not at a funeral, but also a good way for a pastor to remind you through your breathing and through your singing about the ends of life. People being born, people transitioning, people passing on, and our love and excitement that God is with them. The harder part to figure out in a sermon or in our own lives is what we do with the messy middle, right? How do we live each day? What does it mean to follow what God's up to? Do we think God's up to something good, tricking us? Is God a rule master? Is God the patient parent? who never uses negative language, but always tries to steer us in the right direction. How often our idea of God comes from whatever the latest, greatest baby book philosophy is for that generation. Have you noticed that? Baby books that tell us, raise your child with a firm hand. If you give them all of the structure they need, they'll do everything right in the rest of their lives. Spanking is okay. That generation had a God who very much parented the same way, right? As baby book ideas have changed, our understanding of God has changed. We might keep a little from this idea and some from this one, when we're really mad at what other people are doing in the name of God, we might lean towards God being angrier than when we're up to something. At least that's sometimes the way I do it. But what do we make of this strange book of Job? Not one that pastors often pick to read from the pulpit, unless you're reading from the end of Job. The end of Job is the part where God explains how intricately the world is made. And knowing what we do about quantum physics, we know that the world is so much bigger and impressively built than we can articulate. There is space between atoms that have jobs and quirks. I don't understand it all, and I'm not a scientist, but it's fascinating. And so very often it's easy to just skip to the end of the Gospel of Job and just say, look how I created you. Wasn't that amazing? Ta-da! Right? And God becomes this magician or a scientist who is explaining how loved we are by how long it took to make us from scratch. Right? God the great chef. It's the beginning of Job that's a little bit more difficult to figure out. Job is a book that is really long and really unfair. Job has a perfect life. And
and then Job, for many, many chapters, loses everything in horribly unjust ways that every character says he does not deserve. God said he doesn't deserve the bad things that are happening. Satan says he doesn't deserve the bad things that are happening. His friends assume he must have done something to deserve what's happening, because why else could it happen? It's too unfair to be as unfair as the book of Job is. What in the world is this text doing here? What in the world was your pastor thinking having us sing a Christmas hymn and then put this text in here, this text about unfair suffering in the world. At first, as I was thinking about the book of Job, I was thinking about the Bible as one long narrative. If you start at the beginning, I like this idea because it means that God learns from us and God grows, that the characters and the people who are God's people grow and learn. They start from just thinking about themselves and their own creation fixated on their puberty a little bit at the beginning, to wondering how to make this world a good place when it seems like they can't control others. You've heard me talk about God having an Etch-a-Sketch. I created it. No, that didn't work. I created it. No, that didn't work. And trying again and again and again to try to figure out how to make a perfect creation for God's people that matched the love that God had. And it kept eroding and falling apart. Sure, with enough time and perspective, you see that the Grand Canyon is beautiful, but during the first collapse of this beautiful land that you created, you probably don't know how beautiful the breaking is gonna be. I imagine in this Exodus time, right, Moses goes through the waters, they're freed from slavery, they're starting over, God brings them food through the fog, and all they do is complain, right? God's speaking to them directly. All they do is complain. God says, fine, well, maybe a list of 10 rules will help. Just 10. That's all you have to do. Stop gossiping and being mean to each other. Just focus on these 10 things. I think the people in Exodus also had as much ADHD as I do, right? They're like, oh, look, a shiny bull. Oh, look. Where's that milk and honey you said we could have? And they keep complaining, and at one point in the gospel, they ask God to stop talking to them. God speaks to a group of people in history so much that they say, can you please just give us a break from your talking to us and trying to like nag our lives in the right direction? We've all had that moment at least once where we've had to ask our parents to stop guiding us as much and to maybe let us figure out some things on our own. So maybe this was the people of God trying to come into their own and find out who they are with a little distance from their parent creating God. I imagine God, have you ever had people say, you're talking too much and just leave me alone? And have you ever erred on the side of just not saying anything to them anymore? I have. You don't like my feedback? Fine, I won't give you feedback anymore. Let's see how good you can do without me. I imagine God being like me. God giving distance to the people who had asked for it and saying, fine. You do good stuff, you get good things. You don't do good stuff, you get bad things. That's the way the world's going to work from now on. I'm not going to tell you anything. Let's see how that goes for you. And we get to the beginning of the book of Job, and people are living in a time where if you do good things, you get good things. If you do bad things, you get bad things. And Satan who is the trickster, the one who is supposed to determine if we love God as much when God's not looking, says, I, I don't know. If Job has all of this power and this privilege and this money, does he really love you? Or does he really just love that his family is perfect? That he has a great job, that he has enough money, that he can feed his kids? Does he like the convenience? of everything going well, or does he really love you? Would he love you if things went bad? God didn't have text or TV back then, or surveillance cameras everywhere to know everything that was happening. Just Satan going down and checking to see if people were 
as faithful when God wasn't looking. And God says, okay, if you really think Job isn't faithful, maybe I'm parenting the wrong way. Maybe giving good things to good people and bad things to bad people just creates people who don't realize that I exist at all. Have you ever seen those movies, sometimes on Lifetime? And they teach you at the end that if you struggle through something, you understand love much better because you know the opposite. You know what it means to lose something, and you have a deeper knowledge. And so maybe God's good. Great. We're going to teach Job this great lesson. By knowing hardship, he's going to appreciate the stuff that he has more. And so he starts by giving Job facial blemishes. Right? Like me last week with the cold sores. And then it goes on further. And Job says nothing. He doesn't complain. He doesn't grumble. He's not like those Israelites out in the wilderness. And then his family's killed. And then he loses his farm. And then everyone hates him. And God takes away everything. And finally, when it seems like he's hit rock bottom, Job, still not complaining, rebuilds his whole life. He gets a new, new kids, a new wife, new cows, a new farm, new friends, because this whole time, it's as if this is the first time something unfair has ever happened to anyone in this town. Right? They have no comprehension that something unfair can happen to someone. And everyone's idea is, well, Job must have done something. It's like that clip you see on the news after something horrible happens, and they go to the neighbor's houses, and the neighbors go, well, he seemed like a great guy. That's all of the friends and neighbors who are like, well, he seemed like a great guy, but he must not be because he lost all of his stuff. So Job finally rebuilds his life. He doesn't complain. And it doesn't seem like anyone learns a lesson at the end, right? Job doesn't seem to have appreciated God more because Job always appreciated God. This suffering seems like it was for nothing. Job never gets pushed to the point where he demands God bring justice in the world. It just keeps piling on. His friends and neighbors never have a moment where they think, Boy, we were really tough on Job. Maybe we should have supported him or shared stuff. They don't learn any community lessons. And at the end, Job still praises God. And God's answer to Job is, oh yeah, you think you've got everything figured out? Well, you don't even know how complicated this world is. And God seems mad at Job still for not getting mad. What a bizarre book of the Bible. And then it ends. No lessons learned by any characters. No simple answers about if good things are going to happen to good people and bad things are going to happen to bad people. Just this God who seems to go after Job with a vengeance, take all his things away, and never say sorry at the end. What a dumb book of the Bible. Right? I do think that there are lessons in this, though. Have you ever had a moment? I know growing up in South Dakota, I believed the world was fair. People who did good things got good things. People who did bad things had negative things happen. We hear that narrative throughout our world, particularly now during the Republican political debates, right? If you do good things, you get good things. If you do bad things, then you deserve bad things, and whatever happens to you is your problem, right? That narrative still exists in our world. I held it for a very long time, and then something unjust happened to me. I saw ways in which I was different and couldn't change it. I saw civil rights violations in the world, ways that people were being punished or told that they were bad. Even when they hadn't done anything, they were just born with a certain color of skin, and it made no sense. But thankfully, unlike Job, there have been people in this world who demand justice. It 
It's not our job to just take it. When God brings difficult things, we need to let people know so we can get help. We need to ask for help when we need it. Job didn't do that. I'm not always the best at it, but it's better when I do that. Our world is really complicated. It's really complicated. We live with neighbors who might have the idea that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, but we have lived and learned from our suffering. We know illness comes to people who are the most amazing people in the world. Right? We know that war affects people in parts of the country who have nothing to do with the politics that we're mad about. We know that poverty and homelessness comes to people who experience mental health issues who aren't of their own making. We know that addiction is a social problem as much as an individual problem. There's lots of people who did wrong. God should not have tested someone by bringing all of those things on someone. Satan shouldn't have talked him into it. The neighbors shouldn't have been such busybodies and assumed that Job deserved it. Job should have had a breaking point. He should have said, God, this is not just, and you are a good God. I love you, you're amazing, but bring justice to this world. There should have been reconciliation in the end. There should have been a moment in this story where people experience resurrection rather than just suffering for seemingly no purpose. Thank goodness we have the rest of the Bible to help with that. Right? After this comes the book of Isaiah, which teaches us how to complain when bad things happen. Right? How to be mad when injustice happens in the world. We have the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, which tells us that God has taken all of the suffering so that there's none left that we need to endure in order for God to love us. We have the texts that still are a little bit gossipy from Paul, but try their best at least to help each other. And we have texts like Revelation that say, even if we don't get it all figured out, even if we never see that land of milk and honey, we choose to be on God's side. Maybe justice will only come at the end and we'll never see it now. But we're not going to give up. We're not going to stop loving each other and helping each other and asking for help when we need it. This creation is bigger than us. The disasters of the world are bigger than us. Figuring out what is fair is way bigger than I can figure out. Think of the mess the Pope got in this week. Right? When people thought he was picking sides. Our work is to love the best we can. The best we can. To forgive the best we can. The best we can to be good neighbors the best we can, to love people 